introduction, for the great introduction, serverless analytics and monitoring. Uh, so now we'll switch a bit our focus. Doesn't work. Oh well. Um, the topic now is Cloud Foundry. Any one of you has heard of Cloud Foundry before? Just heard and who has used Cloud Foundry? Just slightly less hands. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So um, after this talk, I want to make sure that you really understand what Cloud Foundry is, what it brings to the table, and that it's actually really useful for everyone, I would say. Uh, so my name is Fabian. I work as a software engineer at Numacom. Um, I'm also doing, enjoying woodworking at home. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I also have a blog. Um, so if you want to reach out, feel free. Um, this is the whole bunch of us at Mimacom. Uh, we've had a great team event this year where we all met, actually. It was quite a couple of nice few days. Anyone see me? <laughs> Probably not. I'm so weird, like, in the mood, but... All right, so Cloud Foundry. What is Cloud Foundry, actually? So Cloud Foundry is, well, if you follow this sentence, it's kind of an industry platform for cloud applications. Uh, it's it's designed for the enterprise, so we're not talking about a small side project, we're talking about kind of lots of hardware, enterprise things. And it's also built for fast cycle innovation. That means with, that with Cloud Foundry, we can really move um, like to the market really quick and help, and that helps the enterprise to like keep the pace that we have currently. So Cloud Foundry is also not just a product, uh, but it's also a foundation. So there's lots of companies involved with Cloud Foundry, lots of contributors to Cloud Foundry as it's an open source uh, product. So there's like no single vendor that produces or writes and sells Cloud Foundry. It's, it's a, like a combined effort of lots of companies. As you can see here, there's also lots of huge companies that really do make a lot of uh, contributions. So there's like no real, not really a single vendor that does all the effort, but Everyone that you, especially the Plot team members, everyone has contributed a great deal of features to the platform. So two years ago, it was really easy to talk about Cloud Foundry because it was kind of unique uh, what we had. So when we talk about Cloud Foundry, or also what we talk about when we talk about Cloud Foundry today, we mean the platform as a service. Uh, so there's an open source product, as I've mentioned. The Cloud Foundry application runtime is actually is the offering uh, or the open source product. But Pivotal has, for example, packaged this and sells it or and distributes it under the Pivotal application service. So this is kind of the most well-known distribution of Cloud Foundry. And this is, for example, one vendor that really took Cloud Foundry and made a like, proprietary offering around it. So the, it's still certified that the, the code, the open source code, hasn't been modified. So the API is kind of the same, um, but they have built features around it. What Cloud Foundry also uh, added to the ecosystem is actually a container runtime. So this is like a Kubernetes offering that Pivotal has also added to its like proprietary offering, the Pivotal Container Service. But there's also an open source product that does this, uh, the container runtime. And to complete kind of the ecosystem, we also have a function service here in, in Cloud Foundry namespace, which is called Project Drift. From a kind of historical point of view, Cloud Foundry platform as a service is the oldest one. It's like really major, and a lot of companies are using it. Container service has picked off some uh, traction. So there's, a, you see people adopting it, um, starting to use it. So this is kind of moving from from a beta to a production grade, and this is kind of more like alpha of this function service. So it's kind of the maturity of these um, is different. We've been talking about as a service uh, for some time. So when we look at infrastructure, we have a lot of uh, different as a services. So we can have like really hardware at the bottom, which is also able to have this as a service, uh, but when we start things, it's usually at the infrastructure as a service level. Um, so that's like where Cloud Foundry can be deployed on an infrastructure as a service. And you there have the three offerings, the container as a service, platform as a service, and the function as a service in Cloud Foundry. And what you can do, of course, is build a software as a service on top of it. Um, if you look at this, um, 
and then you need to choose like what what's the perfect platform for your use case then there's like two different ways to look at this one is you, you get increased flexibility um, the more like lower level you are the more flexibility you have obviously so with hardware you can basically do anything whereas with the platform as, as a service you're more restricted and opinionated to how to do things uh, but on the other hand the operational efficiency actually increases through the circles so with the software as a service you basically put the credit card and it just works hopefully um, but it's like really efficient in, in operations whereas with hardware you have to do a lot of stuff yourself and why would you use cloud foundry at all so what, on the one hand cloud foundry is open source which is really cool you can just have a look at it see how it actually works so there's like no hidden code no binaries um, there's the source you can compile it you can run it um, and cloud foundry I mean, it's really cool like from a tech perspective, but it also allows us to move to, to the market with our application really fast. So, so I will also demo that later on. You can see like if we have an application, it's like super fast to put this into production and just to bring it to your customers. Um, what's really nice about CloudFormly is that it's also scalable. So you can't only scale the applications that you run on CloudFormly, but you can also scale the platform like by itself. So even if you have like hundreds of thousands of applications running, um, it's still doable with Cloud Foundry. So the biggest Cloud Foundry deployments uh, really do have more than 100,000 applications running on them. And that's pretty amazing because you basically take the same open source core and you can put it in your own data center and run it and you can take for granted that you probably won't run into any scaling issues operating the platform. And that's pretty amazing. Um, so let's have a look at what Cloud Foundry really is and how we can, can use it. So I said it's a platform as a service and we can run it on an infrastructure as a service. Uh, so the layer here in between is a tool called Posh. It's um, written by the Cloud Foundry team and it's um, like kind of orchestrates a, a highly distributed uh, deployment because Cloud Foundry is composed of a lot of uh, virtual machines. And they run on an infrastructure as a service of choice. So Bosch kind of has an abstraction layer between there and you can basically deploy the same uh, cloud foundry components on any of the most well-known infrastructure as a service providers. And it just works, uh, so that's really great. And on top of the cloud foundry core, of course, your applications uh, will run. If you use cloud foundry from a development point of view, all you do is you take your application as it is, uh, you, you push kind of the source code into the platform and what Cloud Foundry does, it wraps a container around your application. For example, if you, in the Java case, you, you wouldn't put the Java files, but rather like the jar file um, you, you got out of that. Um, and Cloud Foundry will just build a container around that and run it in the platform. But in the PHP case, um, you would just upload all the PHP files and Cloud Foundry would still build a container, um, but that's run in the platform. So you didn't take care of building the container. And Cloud Foundry has a kind of an opinionated set of production grade um, like settings that really take your or, or make your um, application really bulletproof. Cloud Foundry is only like providing a runtime. So that means only the containers are in Cloud Foundry. And if you want to have external data storage or services, you need to run them outside of Cloud Foundry. There's a nice marketplace so you can access these kind of things. Um, but it's not in the platform by itself. In Cloud Foundry, I mean, I've said you can run like a couple of thousand to a hundred thousand apps in there, so you need some kind of tenancy management. Um, what we have in Cloud Foundry is a really flat hierarchy, so that means we have organizations, that's kind of the topmost level of organization, and each organization um, can have multiple spaces and in those spaces you actually push the applications so then it's up to the kind of the, the company on how to allocate like the organizational structure and map this to this flat um, hierarchy so you can have like the research and development department that's being mapped to an organization which has a test and QA space um, I haven't met a company that has like a clear mapping of how to map things so usually it's like rather random and how it just works best so some are organized 
kind of by, by department, others are organized by project, uh, whatever fits best. But Cloud Foundry just has these two levels, uh, so keep them in, in mind. What do you get from these two levels is, of course, you have users there. Uh, those users have roles, uh, but you also have uh, quotas there. So you can like restrict the amount of resources uh, that an organization has. Like, for example, the, the amount of memory that your containers can consume or the number of applications you can run within that organization. And that also applies to the space. Uh, so you can also, like, within an organization, constrain things on, on the space itself with a quota, and you have different roles um, and potentially also users in the space. So the most important role here is the space developer, uh, which would typically be a developer. He has like full access to a space and push apps, CE logs, and things. Um, so that's pretty cool. So once you have the space uh, and you've pushed the application, it needs to have a route. Uh, that means you want to like access your application from the outside. And what Cloud Foundry does is it has kind of or it helps you in, in, in generating these routes and they actually really work right out of the box. So what Cloud Foundry has is, I mean, it's like secure by default, so it takes care of certificates, your app is like always available through HTTPS, um, and it's available with a custom like subdomain um, for the application itself or the hosting. So if you push the app, my app, um, you can make it available at, at the subdomain my app, um, then there's domains available in the platform, so you can add an arbitrary number of domains to the platform. Usually there's like a shared domain, for example, in the case of the, the public uh, Pivotal Web Services, which is the, the public offering of Cloud Foundry by Pivotal. It's called uh, cfapps.io. And after that, you can have another path prefix, so your application would then have like this in front, so for example, the API, V2 um, prefix here could this is also what Cloud Foundry can do, and then the, the account endpoint would be app specific. So this everything behind that V2 Cloud Foundry would be just routing to your application, and that means that if like a couple thousand applications or these containers in the end run in, in the infrastructure by this kind of routes Cloud Foundry knows exactly where to route the traffic. And that's all we need to know to push our first application. So let's see what we can do here. So I have a Spring application here. Um, it's a demo application. It's called Spring Music. It's um, also on GitHub. Can you kind of read this? Like maybe it's a bit smaller, right? So as you can see here, this is just a standard uh, Spring Boot application. It has some, some controllers here, like the info controller. Um, and the only thing that's different from a standard Spring Boot application is that I put a manifest here. Um, so good thing is the editor is big, but not the font. Where is it? And in this manifest file, um, what it does is it kind of describes what Cloud Foundry has to do with this application. So in this case, the application's name is uh, Team Talks Dash Music. Um, so that's the name we will see in the application. I'll just put the um, path to the jar file here, and I configure the build pack, which builds the container from this jar file, and say I want to use like the Java version 11. Um, so that's all there is, and what I then need to do is here in this um, terminal, I can just say CF push. Um, so I already logged into Cloud Foundry, and what this CF push now does is it reads the manifest file, it gets the app name, takes the jar file, uploads it to Cloud Foundry, and then Cloud Foundry just starts to, to build um, the container around it. <coughs> Um, so that's what we see here. So things are uploaded. Um, now this build pack thing just happens where it has some 
I mean, it detects also different languages. It sees, oh, this is a jar file, so it's going to take the Java build pack. It's then, then doing here some, for example, the JDK memory calculator is being used to calculate heap size and stuff. So that's everything the Cloud Foundry does for you. So it sees what what your container size is, and it has some opinion on, on like what heap size works well for most applications. And it also has some, some container security here, adding even the spring reconfiguration, so some, some support because it detected it's a Spring Boot application. And then eventually it's finished assembling the container and then it will start it. Uh, so this is what happens now, as you can see here. It says it's waiting for the app to start. And within some seconds, you should see that it actually has started. There we go. So it says here the state is running. Um, and the application is there. Uh, so it actually has a URL, which is called teamtalks-music.cffapps.io. If I go to the browser, I can just put this URL, and there we go. Actually, I need to put the HTTPS. So now it's safe. <laughs> okay, there we go. This is kind of a sample application, some music library, whatever. Um, but we have it there, so like from the jar file, I just did the CF push and it's like a minute or two and we have an up and running application. So that's pretty pretty powerful. Um, from it, now what we can do is, here's kind of the user interface of Cloud Foundry or the so-called apps manager of the web service. And I pushed into this space and as we can see, here's already the app there. So I can now look at this app and I can see, okay, here's like kind of container, it's doing okay, um, and this is what we get from the user interface. But we'll look at some details after the next couple of slides. <clears throat> and let's have a look at how to operate things now that we push them. So in a nutshell, the Cloud Foundry architecture um, with some blue boxes, so this is like on a, some level in between. So. What we have, like, what's really important to Cloud Foundry is routing, obviously, because we have lots of HTTP traffic coming in, so that's really good scale out. And the router just takes care of routing to the correct container. Uh, we also have the Cloud Controller, which is an important component. You see a push that I did, uploaded everything, and called all the endpoints in this Cloud Controller. So this is kind of the interface for the developer or the API. And this is actually the same API across all Cloud Foundry distributions. So whether it's open source or some proprietary thing, um, everything's like going through this Cloud Controller. We have the concept of service brokers. We'll have a look at that later. That integrates all the databases and things. Um, we also have some authentication, metrics, and logging, um, like right integrated into the platform. And a huge messaging layer, because as you can imagine, if we scale to 100,000 applications, we need some distributed systems and we need messaging. So the core of Cloud Foundry is Diego. Uh, Diego is a container engine, so it's similar, really similar to Docker. It uses Linux uh, kernel features such as cgroups and namespaces to isolate things. And within um, Diego, we have these Diego cells, so that's really a virtual machine and the infrastructure as a service. And on that Diego cell, we run multiple containers uh, so that Diego cell is then capable of really running the app. So what we just did, you see it pushes, we put placed one container on, on a Diego cell. To get that container, I mentioned we have this build pack. Um, so during the CF push, um, it's called the staging. Uh, so during that staging, Cloud Foundry really turns the source code or the jar file into a container, which is then stored as a droplet in the platform. So Cloud Foundry hasn't to rebuild the container all over again. We can just reuse this once we have the droplet. And those build packs are really capable of doing lots of things. So they have like an opinionated set to make your application production ready. So that means it can add frameworks, runtimes, like the, the JDK, for example, in the correct version. It can add application performance monitoring tools. It can put certificates uh, in place. So all these kind of things that you would like manually need to do to really have your application in production great, um, Cloud Foundry does kind of by default or with some slight configuration through this uh, concept called the build packs. And that's pretty nice because if you imagine that 
I mean, we're using this at customers with like a couple hundred to a thousand developers. So they have a huge number of teams and by using build packs, like all their infrastructure is operated really homogeneous. So they have like, if they need to fix things in, in, in some Apache that's used in the build pack, they can just go and like update the build pack and the, all the developers just like restage their applications, then rebuilding the stuff and everyone has the fix. So that's pretty cool because it like really eases um, the productive operation. What's also really cool about Cloud Foundry is that you can basically scale horizontally really easily. Um, you can just see that in a minute. Um, so we can scale out and add more containers. We can also scale up and add more memory to a single container to have bigger ones. Uh, that's also um, possible. There's also some auto-scaler um, in the marketplace, so you can just add it and based on some thresholds, you can de um, define when to scale up, when to scale down. So that all comes with the platform. There's also a lot of blog logging and monitoring infrastructure set up, so you can, like, once you push the app, all it needs to do is write its logging output to standard out. Cloud Foundry then collects these logs and aggregates them in a centralized log stream. So that means that even if you scale out, you can like see all your instance logs in a, in a unified log stream. And also you can see like from all applications that you run in like with the same methods and technologies. So it's all there enabled by default and you can just access it. Um, but also there's lots of um, metrics being collected, um, not only for the apps, but also for the platform. So from a platform operations point of view, it's also really nice that we have all that information. Now, when I did the CF push, um, I initially deployed it, but there is a point in time where we need to update a revised version of the application. And Cloud Foundry does, um, in the meantime, actually does support Canary deployments. It used to not support any specific style of deployment, um, but you could easily build this with the tools Cloud Foundry provides. So are you familiar with blue, green, and canary deployments? Some, some yes, some no. Um, so what a blue, green deployment is, is it basically we publish or we have the old version, for example, the green one, and we have a new version, the blue one. And at some point in time, we just switch over all the traffic to the new version. So we deploy them, and once we consider it there, we just switch over. Um, we can do that easily in Cloud Foundry by just routing or adding new routes to the Cloud Foundry router. Um, so that's like a CLI command that is propagated to all Cloud Foundry routers in milliseconds. So that's really like pushing all the traffic over. With the Canary deployment, we do this gradually. So that means usually we have like a couple of instances. We scale one down in the old version. We scale one up in the new version until like all of the instances are scaled up in the new version. Then we can like shut down the old one. And that's just happened over time. So that means that also traffic is being like routed over to the new application over time. And that's being integrated into the Cloud Foundry CLI now. So that's like really part of the platform now, um, which is pretty cool. You could previously just build it uh, by yourself, but let's have a look at how this actually works um, in, in real life. So what we can do here is or what I prepared, remember that navigation bar um, at the top of our application it was green. So let's now turn this uh, to a red one. So all we need to do, or actually it's blue, whatever. <laughs> so it's just a different color. Um, what we now need to do, of course, is um, rebuild our application. So in this case, we'll just produce a new jar file. And what I will now do is a blue-green deployment or some sort of mix in between. Let's see. So we will need to now, I mean, we just pushed the Team Talks Music app, and now we'll just push this Team Talks Music blue app. So this will just be a new application. Um, we can now push this. And now that I updated, the app name, we will also have a different route. So this won't affect the existing application, um, but I can just 
run this and it should now upload and stage our new application. While this happens in the background, what we can do now is um, scale out horizontally like the one we already have. So that means um, just to, to see how this works, um, once, so I've got like an environment variable here, the app index, and this is zero. And if I reload here, it's gonna stay at zero. So I just have a single instance. Um, that's what I currently have there. And now what I can do um, is just uh, scale this to a couple of instances. So on the command line, you can read this hopefully. What you see here is um, we've got the application that we've had before. You just see the, the one I just pushed is currently starting. So what I can now say is just scale uh, our existing application and please do scale it to four instances. And Cloud Foundry says okay. And if we now look at the app itself or the settings Cloud Foundry has for this, we already see here that we currently have four instances and three of them are starting. And let's see again. Still starting. So some metrics actually arrive here. It should be just a matter of seconds. Some are already running, which is pretty cool. So once I reload here a couple of times, we see the Cloud Foundry automatically like routes traffic uh, to the new instances. This is like app index two here. So this is really a new container that we are currently addressing. Now it's three, three and we should reach all of them as long as they are still healthy, which is pretty cool. So Cloud Foundry also monitors like which ones are healthy, which ones are not, and only routes traffic to the ones that are healthy. Uh, let's have a look if the deployment for the other ones succeeded, and it's true. So if we go here, we have a new route. As you can see here, it's the, the blue one now. Um, so and obviously it changed to blue, so the last one was green, and this one is blue. So what we can do now is um, just to, to make this a bit more interesting, I just scale down the green one. So for the green one, we now only have a single instance so that we can see the difference. So Cloud Foundry immediately removes the other ones, so I just had like before, as soon as I execute this command, the containers are now physically still there, but just traffic is not being routed anymore. And what I will just do now is, we now have like the blue application up and running, and I can just add a route to it, so that it also receives traffic from the, like, from the domain we already have here, so the Team Talks Music one. So I will add a route to the blue application and it has to have, have the host name Team Talks Music or not. I forgot the domain name. Um, so the domain name is apps.io. And as you can see, it should add the route Team Talks Music.cfapps.io to our blue application which means that now, as we are doing kind of this blue-green or canary deployment, you can choose. Once I reload this, we should at some point see the blue you, one. The other URL. Which one? You added it to the, to the blue one. Yep. But you were calling the, the other one in the browser. Uh, yes, I added it to the blue application, but the route of, of the other one. So this is the original uh, domain or URL, and I'm adding it to the other one, so they both should now, or like reload balance at least. So they should, or there's some bad cache. I'm not sure what, this is just, 
server. So we now have both applications here. Uh, the first one, um, we can see at the, the routes um, that we currently have. This is um, the team talk music route that we have for the first one. And the second one, our blue one, should now have two routes, actually. So we have the blue one, but also traffic from teamtalksmusic.cfapps.io should be routed uh, to the blue application. So I'm not sure why we don't see the blue bar now. Just as a, so that one's really sticky. Well, usually it should work. Please just believe me that it actually works. Um, what I can also do is so what I can now do is at least remove the map or unmap the route from the old application so now it should really not get traffic anymore so once we reload this okay. <laughs> it should actually load balance I'm not sure why why it didn't we didn't see it but that's the cloud probably okay great um, so let's have a look at the other application here um, so for example I have the locks here um, I can tail the logs, uh, so as soon as I take this one out, so if I reload this, we should see logs being added here, uh, which is pretty cool uh, because I can see like with just in my browser, I can watch a real time uh, stream of the logs, um, but I can also see interesting things. So. Luckily, this is a demo application and it has a row exception endpoint. So we can also actually see like errors that happen here. Um, what's also really cool in Cloud Foundry is it observes uh, the application's health. Uh, so there's actually an endpoint to kill this application. Um, so let's just kill it. And it actually has just failed. So what we should see here is uh, that this has failed. So it says, Cloud Foundry says, the app crashed. And what you also see here is that Cloud Foundry is immediately restarting the app. So once an instance crashes, Cloud Foundry notices, it has built in health checks for the applications con containers and just automatically restarts the application. So I didn't do anything now. Um, Cloud Foundry is just like restarting it. And there we go. It's already up again. Uh, this is still the kill endpoint, so I just killed it again. <laughs> so I'm going to close this tab. Now, if we had more containers, I would have just killed a single container, and Cloud Foundry would have just taken the ones that are still healthy, of course. Uh, so that's pretty convenient, because if as soon as I scale out and there is something going on, um, Cloud Foundry is really capable of just starting it again. And actually, if it continues to crash and crash and crash again, Cloud Foundry really is like, it's like retrying, and of course, with a delay, and I think Cloud Foundry do this hope after around about 30 days or so. So that's like, like really trying to get this thing up and running again. Um, so once it's there, of course, uh, the app comes back. Um, so that's pretty nice. All right. So one thing here is also services. So we have the Spring Music um, application and it has an in-memory database. And we want to change that. So services are bound to applications uh, through a marketplace. Um, we can just provision an instance of service. And the credentials to that is exposed through, a, through an environment variable. So all the things um, that 
the service provides, like the database URL, the database name, the, whatever is just provided to the application in this environment variable. And from there, it's just being um, picked up by the application and uh, can then be consumed. Um, there's a marketplace, so there's lots of pre-made offerings. Um, and how it actually works is by using a so-called service broker. It's a really simple interface, and it's also like a specification that's open source. You can use service brokers for any other platform as well. Um, what you do is you just create a service which provisions the database, and you can delete it. And then you need to bind it to a specific instance. So that's kind of, this is creating the database, this is creating the user for your application. So if you have like multiple clients for the database or for the message queue, whatever, you can have like unique things. But this is kind of um, what the, the service broker does. So Cloud Foundry just accepts these requests through HTTP and forwards them to the service broker and then needs to provision things. How the service broker does that, Cloud Foundry doesn't really care. So the MySQL service broker could, for example, just create a table, it could create a database, it could create like a new VM running a MySQL, it could create a cluster. Cloud Foundry just doesn't care. Um, it, all, all it cares about is that these endpoints complete within a certain time limit, um, and they um, then can like um, need to be there. So we can just look at that. just do this here from the apps manager. So I have our new application here. I can create a new service. Um, so here's the catalog. I'll take this um, MySQL database here. Um, I'll just take this uh, free tier here um, and select the plan. I'll just call this uh, music database. And I can like add it to a space here. The, the space I have the app in. And I'm also like automatically binding it to the app as I've just created it from within the app context, it's also directly bound. So by clicking this button, actually PRDB um, provisions a database in the background and binds it to the application. So by binding, it exposes the variables and then you can use the database from the application. Pizza already there? And we still have <laughs> we still have a couple of minutes. So let's see, uh, the database is there. Um, what it says is, uh, it's like, um, we should restage our application. That means we are exposing the credentials through the environment variables, which means that if I now go to the settings here, um, and I view the environment variables, we have here this VCAP services I've been talking about. It says like it's here's the PRDB, um, here's actually the music database, here's the JDBC string. We can just use it and connect to it. Here's the, like the, the host port, the username. That's a really insecure password. It's like got to complain that PRDB can use like eight characters. Um, <laughs> but it's there. So once we restart the application, it's going to pick up the environment variables and uh, Spring Cloud connectors will then establish like the JDBC template and so the application can actually put things into the database. We actually see this here. Um, so the profile was previously detected as Cloud and once we restage, uh, the Spring profile should have some database as well. then things are actually being persisted to that database. So once I scale out and change things, um, we see them obviously in all instances as they use the same database connection. Still restarting.
have to do it. Well, yes. The route we wrote. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you can see here now, we persist things to MySQL. Um, so that means all the things I would change now go to the database. And um, that's like two minutes to add a database to the application, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, okay, so that gives you kind of a broad overview of Cloud Foundry. And what, when we started customers with this, uh, they usually have like a couple hundred developers um, wanting to hop on the platform. And um, if you really want to join the journey of Cloud Foundry, the first thing you need usually is an agile mindset. So we've seen that like, especially with cloud platforms, um, it's like super helpful to be agile. Is any one of you working in a non-agile environment? Probably not if you're here, uh, which is great. Um, I mean, you probably all agree that this really helps and it does, in fact. Um, and it's also not about being agile and calling it agile, but really living agile. We also do like pairing, mob programming. And these kind of things really help adopting, learning things because cloud platforms usually change very fast. So you have need kind of a huge amount of knowledge sharing. Um, but not only within the team, uh, but also across teams. Uh, so what we usually have um, when, when we use cloud platforms and a customer that like really establishes it, we have a platform team. Uh, that means that's a team where uh, there's actually a, a nice quote by, by James, um, a team responsible for building a superior path to production. Um, and that's what I believe is really true. Um, and operate this as a service um, to developers. So this is what you've just seen. I mean, it's really a superior path, in my opinion, uh, to production to get like from, from a jar file up to like the, the service is ready and you can like access team talks and minus music.cfapps.io from your mobile. So it's like not something fake here. Um, it's like really there. And with Cloud Foundry, it's super easy to do so. Um, and the role of the platform team is to help developers achieve this, to spread the knowledge, help building tools around it, provide the services, build the ecosystem, and that's uh, really helpful. I mean, when you're not starting in Greenfield, um, you also have kind of a journey to make. Um, so that's also really helpful to see where you are, what you want, um, this cloud native maturity model. So cloud ready is like, it works, kind of we made it work in the cloud, which is good. Uh, you can run things in Cloud Foundry for sure uh, that aren't designed to run in Cloud Foundry. Um, it works. Um, then there's, if you do some things, um, for example, the 12 factors, um, then you can also like horizontally scale with ease. So that's really great. Um, once you can deal with failure also, um, because as you've seen, we can just kill applications and Cloud Foundry restarts them. So if you design for failure, Cloud Foundry really supports you and makes sure you have a production grade and highly available um, deployment. And once you master that, you can have the cloud native um, applications. You can go API first, um, design for failure with microservices and spread out your business um, domain. So that's really nice, um, but it's a journey. And it's okay to be like anywhere, also to run simultaneously on any stage here, uh, because usually you have old things, you have new things, and you just need to make sure it works uh, together. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed like the introduction to Cloud Foundry, and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Well, yes, not made. So, I mean, it's containers in Cloud Foundry, and most developers assume, oh, cool, containers, I want to run my database in Cloud Foundry. But that's not the case. So, Cloud Foundry is made kind of for standard web applications, primarily it supports HTTP traffic. There's also a TCP router, it works, um, it has been improved a lot, but I still think that like TCP traffic is more suited for Kubernetes where you're more in control. If you remember the circles, like the, the 
flexibility and with operational efficiency. That's kind of things I would rather put in, in, in Kubernetes, for example. Also, if you think about it, um, the Cloud Foundry is, I mean, we have containers, we set the memory, and the CPU share is like calculated on the memory size. So if we have like specific requirements, for example, high CPU usage or demand for an application like video processing or whatever, it might also not be kind of the best option. So, but if you have like the typical enterprise standard web application, that's just like a really nice platform um, because it just has so a, a high level of um, efficiency and you can run containers that just have Java Spring application really easily or some any other technology. If you use scale horizontal, can those instances communicate with each other? So can I push an event from the one instance to the other? Um, well, uh, yes, you, you can, of course, if you bind like a message queue. Uh, so that's like one option you have. Uh, there's another option, obviously. So when you talk to Cloud Foundry, everything goes through the router. Uh, so that means, I mean, it's, you couldn't do it deterministic, but you could call the app itself, or you could add a host name for each instance. Um, that should also be possible. But um, what you can also do is, um, I mean, if you think about it not having just a single instance there, but the microservices architecture, Cloud Foundry supports also a container network. Uh, so that means that containers can talk directly to each other without going through a Go router. That means you need to, again, take care of client-side load balancing and, and stuff, so it's some more effort on your side, but it, the platform supports it. So if I would want to get started with uh, Cloud Foundry today or, or probably tomorrow, um, how should I start? Should I sign up uh, to the typical uh, Cloud uh, Foundry or should I rather go with my own setup or be open source version? Or what's, uh, what's required to do that? Well, of course, you can come to me, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, if you really want to just try it out, uh, the best way to go is like Pivotal Web Services or IBM Cloud is also running on Cloud Foundry or I mean Bluemix previously, but it's like there's a, a number of hosted services for Cloud Foundry which are just like put your credit card and off you go. Um, if you really want to deploy it, um, you could have a first thing. There's a thing called uh, PCF Dev or PCF Local or CF Local. It's like a, a thing more tailored to developers where you can just run Cloud Foundry on your machine. It's by way no means of production in any way, um, but it's doable. So you can just try and experiment. Um, to really run Cloud Foundry, you need a data center or like AWS and some, some budget on your credit card. Um, but then you can really deploy it and, and run it. 